Welcome, welcome. UBC Dentistry PhD students from the Stevens Institute of Technology. I can't say I know where that one is. Where in the world are you uh, at the Stevens Institute of Technology? Island Health, brilliant. I'm actually a medical trainee on the island, so glad to hear it. Ah, New Jersey, crossing borders here. Wonderful. Again, for those of you just joining us, I'd love to know where in the world you are and what specialty you're representing. Uh, thus far, we have quite a diverse selection. And again, another uh, Victoria Island Health individual. Brilliant. And the clock has struck 4.03 my time, so let's get started. Uh, first off, welcome everyone. To uh, Thank you for joining us today. We have a packed hour for you, filled with brilliant researchers who are dabbling in the world of AI and making strides uh, in it as it applies to medicine. Before we get started, I just wanted to acknowledge the two research clusters that are making this event possible today. First, we have the UBC Data Science and Health, or DASH cluster led by Drs. Anita Palapo and Teresa Sang, where DASH is working to harmonize health data access within the province of British Columbia. DASH envisions the development of a harmonized data ecosystem that can accommodate multimodal and multidimensional data. Their members are applying data science to health research to improve diagnosis, treatment, and prevention of diseases. We're also supported by the UBC Biomedical Imaging and Artificial Intelligence Cluster, led by Drs. Tim Salkudian and Dr. Peter Zamstra, where the BMI AI Cluster is a multidisciplinary and multi-institutional team of over 50 researchers and clinicians, just like many of you, developing groundbreaking AI solutions with vast amounts of data for multimodal and multi-scale biomedical imaging. Just a few words of thought here is that as we perceive healthcare, I think it's interesting to look at it in, in terms of data, as both these groups are looking at data. You know, from a clinical point of view, often we're gathering data, whether that be patient histories, blood work, imaging tests. We're trying to infer and determine causes and correlations from data, it's say diagnoses or progression. And then we're trying to figure out based off data, what is the best treatment option uh, and how to proceed with this individual. Uh, and so breaking down healthcare as a perspective purely of data, it's clear almost, uh, hopefully by the end of this, you'll see that artificial intelligence and data analytics plays a significant role in improving virtually every faucet of health science. Now we are waiting for our, uh, our first panelist, but we'll get started with an introductory session. So it's my pleasure to hand it over to Prashant Pandey, who is a PhD, in, PhD student in biomedical engineering, supervised by Tony Hodgson, one of our faculty members. Prash comes to us from the UK, where he did his undergrad in engineering science at the University of Oxford, and then a master's at UBC in uh, electrical engineering with a focus on image guided computer assistance guidance for orthopedic surgery. Uh, Prash, over to you. Thanks, Rohit. Um, and good afternoon, everyone. Let me just share my screen. Awesome. All right. Um, so it's great to see so many people here from all over the place wanting to learn more about AI and medicine. Uh, and really, my presentation today is just an introductory overview on these topics. And it's really geared towards people who are um, starting to wet their feet and, and trying to understand how they could use AI for their clinical oriented projects. Uh, specifically, I'm just going to go over the basic concepts of what AI is, when uh, it's appropriate to use it, talk about some popular models uh, that are used, and throughout we'll be talking about limitations and considerations to keep in mind uh, as you design your projects and think about how you can apply this uh, to your work. Now, to begin with, I just wanted to clear some of the terminology issues. The, the terms artificial intelligence, machine learning, and deep learning are often used interchangeably in applied fields like engineering and, uh, and medicine, but actually they have, a, um, they have different meanings and a hierarchical relationship between them. Uh, AI just is a general uh, broad reference to algorithms or computer programs that exhibit some characteristic of intelligence 
whereas machine learning is a specific subset of AI algorithms that um, uh, whose performance really improves with uh, the data that it learns over. And deep learning itself is also a subset of machine learning algorithms that specifically refers to uh, neural networks with several layers. And I'll talk about these more specifically later on. Okay, so what exactly is AI? What does it mean to exhibit a characteristic of intelligence? Um, everyone has their own definition. And the one I like using because it's pragmatic is really that an algorithm, an AI algorithm is one that is able to identify patterns in data, which it can use to then uh, create a model and then predict some sort of outcome on new unseen data. And in some ways, uh, AI or, or this definition is similar to human intelligence. For instance, if I asked a, a student uh, or a novice to look at this um, black and white image here that I'm showing and ask them what they're seeing inside this image, they probably would not be able to say anything and just say it looks like nothing. Uh, but perhaps an expert in radiology will be able to see this image and say, actually, it's part of a, it's actually part of a shoulder x-ray. Um, and their expertise will mean that they can identify this pattern from a seemingly nonsense image. However, all of us can look at this second image and be like, oh yeah, that's a shoulder x-ray. I, I totally see that, even though we've never seen this specific image before. And so really that aspect of intelligence, being able to identify patterns on sort of new unseen cases um, is something we also try and um, sort of successfully reproduce in our AI algorithms. Okay, so you know, when should you really consider using AI? Um, it's always important to keep in mind that you should always look at AI as uh, a set of tools for interpreting your data. Uh, and there are many other statistical tools that you could also use to understand your data, uh, either if it's patient data or data from that you've generated from experiments. And um, there is, you know, recently there is, or over the last few years, there's a lot of hype and buzz around AI. And so you shouldn't really just use AI for the sake of it because it's a uh, sexy topic or anything like that. Uh, and there have been some notable cases where this has been done, where uh, you know someone uh, publishes something and in the applied sciences with the headline of using AI, uh, only then to be criticized that they didn't need to do that at all uh, for their study to be successful. So really you should uh, always keep this in mind as well. Okay, so, um, I'm gonna sort of demonstrate when you could use AI with a very simple and totally made up example. Um, let's say you are um, running a clinic and you have a lot of patients that you've noticed um, have recently stopped smoking. So you're trying to understand uh, if there is a relationship uh, between that patient's weight and how many days it took for them to stop smoking. Once again, it's a completely made up example, so it doesn't have to really make any sense. But it's a very simple uh, case. You sort of tabulate this data, you note down weights and days to stop smoking. And one of the first things you could do is plot this on two axes um, and sort of look at this data uh, as a scatter plot. Let's say you have a new patient come in uh, and they, they've heard that you're doing this research and they want to, they're a smoker and they want to stop smoking. So they ask you, how long do you think it will take me to stop smoking? But one thing you could do is sort of just take the average of the data that you've collected uh, and say, okay, well, the average amount of time it takes to stop smoking based on my research is 85 days. However, you look at the data a bit closely and you know that there is, or you can see that there is some sort of linear trend in the data. So perhaps you can give this patient a more accurate estimate um, by extrapolating from this linear trend and say, okay, actually for you, it's probably gonna be more like 100 days to stop smoking, not 85. And even though this is a really simple example, and you know this is the case of linear regression, which is a AI algorithm, um, this is sort of demonstrating that there are two sort of reasons here that you, you could use AI. Uh, and that is when you know that there is a relationship um, or you suspect that there is a relationship uh, or pattern in your data that your AI model you hope will learn. And secondly, you're wanting to predict the outcome um, based on this learned pattern on some sort of new data point, which you did with the new patient who came into your clinic. And so the inverse of this is when, you know, you wouldn't use AI and it's not so important to go into this in too much detail, but for example, let's say you're, you don't actually have a pattern in your data, it doesn't exist at all, uh, or your pattern is very simple, 
and you don't need to make a predictive model, then of course you don't need to use AI algorithms and you should consider other uh, ways to interpret your data. Now, most of the time, it's not true that there is no pattern at all. Um, it's most of the time we don't have enough data to see a meaningful pattern. Um, for instance, let's say we looked at um, a very small window in our data set between the weights of uh, 64 and 67 kilograms. Let's blow this up a little bit. And let's say this is the data that you collected from your patients. If you look at this, you can see that maybe there isn't really much of a trend here at all. And you might um, hastily conclude that there is uh, nothing to see here and nothing to learn. But actually the truth is that we haven't really collected enough data to see the full trend or to learn a meaningful pattern. And so most of the time you're not just measuring noise unless you know there is something wrong with how you're measuring your data, but most of the time, the pattern that we suspect um, just requires a lot of data uh, to sort of learn. And that is also really important to keep in mind. And I'm sure you've heard this before with AI projects, you need to collect a lot of data to be able to accurately model uh, what you're trying to predict. Uh, now also, on the other hand, you could have a very simple pattern. So for example, if your data look like this, where you have, uh, a sudden change after 75 kilograms. Yes, you could use AI to learn this, but also you could just decide a very simple threshold rule and say, okay, everyone above the weight of 75 kilograms, it's gonna take this many days to stop smoking and everyone below is another uh, value. So you don't have to use AI for that, of course. Now with um, AI and, and with all sort of scientific conclusions, there are limitations in terms of the generalizability of that model. So here I'm plotting that same um, linear data again. Let's say you have another patient who comes in and this time they're actually hundred kilograms and they want to stop smoking and they ask you, how long will it take for me to stop smoking? You notice in your data that you actually only have patients uh, tabulated who are up to their range of maybe 85 to 90 kilograms. So what do you tell this patient? Well, you could assume that your linear relationship continues and so tell them, okay, at hundred, it looks like it will take 110 days to stop smoking. But without actually collecting this data, there's no way of knowing that in reality, your trend doesn't look something like this, where at 100 is a much steeper increase in the number of days it takes to stop smoking. And so uh, you will be off by quite a large margin. Uh, and this could, of course, um, be quite disappointing to your patient. And so AI algorithms um, cannot really generalize beyond the data that they have been trained on. Uh, and although this is a huge area of research in um, artificial intelligence and machine learning, it's not something that's yet really uh, been solved. When we talk about um, AI algorithms and, and specifically machine learning algorithms, we generally talk about supervised and unsupervised learning um, algorithms. And supervised learning refers to the case when um, you have the labels for the outcome that you're trying to predict over. And as you guessed it, unsupervised is when you don't have labeled data, but you're still trying to understand structure or um, patterns within your data without um, any particular label or outcome. So for instance, um, let's say in a totally separate example, you are measuring uh, in your clinic, uh, the, the blood pressure of your patients, uh, their resting heart rate, and you have also, you want to predict um, whether or not these patients have diabetes based on these two features or independent variables. Well, to be able to know that you have to first collect data uh, on whether they have diabetes or not. And so if you have gone through the trouble of measuring and, and labeling this, then this is a supervised learning problem. And so your algorithm, if you use a supervised learning algorithm, will be able to learn from this labeled data to improve its accuracy in predicting whether new patients have diabetes or not. On the other hand, let's say you weren't able to, for whatever reason, collect information on whether patients have diabetes, but you still have their blood pressure and heart rate. You can use unsupervised learning algorithms uh, from just these two sets of features to see if there are any patterns or groups within your patients and whether they relate to any clinically meaningful um, variable or outcome. In reality, it's not just two categories, it's more of a spectrum of um, algorithms 
on one hand, you have supervised learning algorithms, which of course require a lot of labeled data, and this can be very costly to collect, uh, especially uh, in healthcare. Um, but the upside is that supervised learning algorithms tend to have a much higher accuracy or predictive power compared to unsupervised algorithms. Um, and in between, there is a category of um, algorithms, which are called semi-supervised. Um, and these learn from few labeled points and sort of try to um, extrapolate those results to unlabeled data. And once again, this is a, well, these are all active areas of um, research. In medicine, we are mostly in sort of applied clinical and, and medical projects. We tend to focus on supervised learning because the accuracy is fairly important, uh, whether it's um, accurately predicting a diagnosis for a patient or um, a prognosis for a treatment, we usually are concerned with having accurate results. So we usually tend to stick to supervised learning algorithms. And within supervised learning, there are also a further two uh, sets of um, uh, problems that we can focus on. And these are, this is regression and classification. And uh, very simply, regression refers to uh, when the output variable that you're trying to predict uh, is on some sort of continuous scale. So for example, when you're trying to predict the number of days to stop smoking, uh, that's on a continuous scale from zero to infinity. And so that would be a, a regression problem. Whereas classification is more uh, when your output belongs to certain distinct categories, which don't necessarily have a numerical relationship between two. So let's say you're trying to predict someone having diabetes or not, that's uh, you know, either they have it or they don't, or maybe they have type one or type two. These are just categorical outputs and that's a classification problem. And it's important to formulate this um, problem beforehand. So if you know if you, you need a regression uh, or you need a classification, it's good to know this because different algorithms are better suited to different kinds of problems. And so it's good to um, answer these questions ahead of time before picking uh, your AI model. Now, there are a whole host of different supervised learning models, um, and I'm sure everyone here has heard about neural networks, and, and by far these are the most popular over the last um, six or more years. Uh, and this is because neural networks have been shown to be extremely accurate uh, because they can theoretically model any nonlinear complex function given enough training data uh, and if they're parameterized um, properly. Um, and as a result, they're used in all kinds of applications, uh, especially in research. But the downside is that they are not very interpretable. And a, uh, a subset of neural networks is something called convolutional neural networks, which are neural networks that are designed specifically for analyzing images, uh, and videos. And these use uh, sort of neurons from neural networks together with something called convolutional filters, which are able to learn and identify image features, um, which are uh, quite different from the features and structure of uh, tabular data or text data. So convolutional neural networks also like neural networks have been shown to be extremely accurate uh, and are used uh, in all kinds of applications, including automatically reading x-rays or other uh, medical imaging. Now, because of the huge, uh, success of neural networks, we also tend to forget more classic uh, AI models like linear logistic regression, decision trees, and clustering algorithms. Uh, but given your problem, it might actually be more appropriate and more accurate to use some of these other algorithms uh, before jumping right to neural networks, which is uh, um, something that uh, we all tend to do. Um, and so here is a sort of handy workflow that, or um, decision tree that you can use yourself to decide what kind of algorithm you should use given how much data you have and what kind of problem you're trying to um, get through. Another way to decide which kind of model you should use for your project is really looking at um, the trade-off between accuracy and interpretability. As I mentioned, neural networks tend to be extremely accurate compared to other algorithms, uh, but if it's actually more important to understand how a particular algorithm made its decision, then neural networks are probably not the best bet uh, there are other algorithms like uh, decision trees or k-nearest neighbors, which may actually be similar in accuracy, but are much more easy to debug and understand when they're deployed in the field. Uh, and so this is another um, requirement that, uh, that is important to keep in mind when designing AI projects. 
And all AI models uh, and all models have uh, a, a few limitations that we should be aware of. And probably the most common one is overfitting uh, or underfitting. And this is uh, the issue where you're trying to model some sort of um, data. And in this case, we have some sort of parabola with noise. Um, of course, if you try to fit a linear uh, model to this, just a line, you would be fairly inaccurate. And at the same time, if you overfit it and used a highly uh, nonlinear, high order function to fit this data, once again, on new test data, you would be fairly inaccurate as well. Uh, and there is a sweet spot in between where you sort of fit a curve, which uh, explains the data well, but doesn't overfit to it. And although it's very easy to see in this uh, simple case, you can we can clearly see what is a good result and what's bad. When we deal with uh, data that is, uh, could be images or uh, complex patient data, it's not really easy to visualize uh, features in 2D like this and know when we're overfitting or underfitting. And so it's really important to have a good evaluation pipeline in place where you can assess models and their accuracy uh, to try and understand if um, your fitting is correct. One of the other issues, and this is particularly true with neural networks, is that even though they're very accurate, they can be very sensitive to the input data or um, the, the parameters that they were used to train with. So looking at these two images, they look totally identical to us humans, but to a neural network that was trained uh, to identify different objects. The one on the left is classified correctly as a pig, whereas the one on the right is totally incorrect and with a disturbingly high confidence. And the reason for this is that the image on the right has a uh, small amount of structured noise injected to it, which a computer is very good at detecting, but to us looks like nothing. Uh, and so, of course, this is something we want to avoid um, at all costs uh, when we deploy our models for uh, patient or healthcare uh, reasons. And, uh, but, you know, it's, it's important to be able to test and know the sensitivity of our um, AI models. Another example of the limited generalizability is uh, done here by these authors where they trained a neural network to identify uh, natural photos of animals and objects. And so for one, of the, one of the categories that was trained with this neural network was photos of turtles. Uh, but when this neural network was shown an actual sort of sculpture of a turtle, um, it was totally incorrectly classified, even though to us, we can clearly tell that this is a sculpture of a turtle and should be identified as a turtle. A neural network has a very narrow view of reality and what a turtle is. And we're not the only ones susceptible. Even giants like Google have trouble um, getting good performance and accuracy when they deploy their AI models in, uh, in the field. And um, one of the uh, sort of most high profile case, cases was when Google trained an algorithm to screen for retinal diseases in fundus photographs, phot photographs. And they found that they actually had really good accuracy in the lab where they were using high grade, um, high quality photographs from professional fundus cameras but when they deployed it in the field, they got very poor accuracy and performance because the quality of the images that was being acquired in clinics and in reality was um, very different to the quality of images that this AI was trained on. And so unfortunately they couldn't really use this for real life screening and they had to pull the model. So hopefully all my examples are um, showing you that you really need to have uh, for a successful AI project, you need to have good data and a good evaluation pipeline. And good data, of course, not just means a lot of labeled data, but it also means that the quality has to be good and representative of what you're trying to model as close as possible. Uh, and if you really want um, generalizability within what you're trying to model, you need to have heterogeneous uh, data in your set as well. And in terms of valuation, you need to have a systematic pipeline to objectively test differences between models to understand which model is best for you, um, how sensitive it is to different types of data and parameters. And of course, it's very important to try and get some statistical uh, testing done to understand the differences you see in performance and if they are significant or not. Um, in terms of evaluation, accuracy is not the only thing to keep in mind. Of course, you want to have accuracy, but uh, in medicine especially, it might be more 
important to minimize your false negatives or some other metric that is um, more important. Uh, and uh, training time or real time execution might also be something to think about. Uh, these are all something that some uh, decisions that need to be sort of uh, nailed down before uh, models are trained and evaluated. And finally, what does it mean to have good data? There are some assumptions we make about the data that we train our AI models with, and specifically this is that of independence and identical distribution. And what this means is that we assume that the data in our training, validation, and test sets when we use algorithms is independent of each other, and there is sort of no relationship between them. Um, in reality, this is very difficult to guarantee, um, but it's important to know that when these assumptions are uh, broken, then the equivalently the performance of our model all, will also drop. Um, and this is also the case with identical distribution where we assume that the way, for example, the, the um, demographic of the patients in our training and validation sets are equally matched in the test set or when, when it's deployed. But of course, this is very difficult to guarantee in real life. And so we should expect the performance to drop when the distribution uh, of our data sets changes drastically. Uh, thank you for listening. I hope all of these, uh, this very quick whirlwind tour of AI was helpful for you and uh, helpful for you to think about how to apply it to your projects. Wonderful. Thank you, Prash. I uh, saw so we had one question in the chat and Danielle's pointed, pointed people to some great resources, but while we have him, any questions for Prash? We'll give everyone a few seconds to think. Uh, you're more than welcome to jump on and ask your question yourself or type it in the chat. All right, seeing none, thank you, Prash. Well, uh, we'll move on to Professor Roger Tam, and I think it's an excellent talk to come right after Prash on whether or not it is deep learning the right choice for your project. Dr. Tam, his, Dr. Tam's research interests are centered on the application of computer vision and machine learning uh, with, the, with relation to the quantitative analysis of medical images. The TAM laboratory currently primarily focuses on the use of magnetic resonance images to improve the understanding of neurological disorders such as MS or multiple sclerosis. In general, the projects in the TAM lab relate to the following topics in medical imaging, in vivo imaging, imaging biomarkers, machine learning, imaging artifacts and their impact on quantitative analysis, computational modeling, and medical, medical informatics, and many more. Uh, I'll pass it over to you, Dr. Tam. And we can see Thank your you. slides. Okay, awesome. Thanks very much, Bahit. Um, Yeah, so I'm just going to um, uh, drill down a little bit on, on something that uh, Prash uh, touched on. And uh, as, as he mentioned, uh, deep learning is the dominant technology in, in, in machine learning. And, and there, there's no doubt that neural networks are very powerful, but they're also overused, right? So the, the earthquakes uh, aftershocks prediction paper is a good example. So um, so that's really the topic of the talk. You know, uh, Hopefully I'll, I'll give you some idea of when it's appropriate to use deep learning and, and when um, it might not be. So I'll start with an motivating, a motivating example on um, uh, you know, wh why, why deep learning in the first place. Right? So if um, a, a person wanted to uh, define the appearance of, of uh, white matter lesions, and in this case, there are multiple sclerosis lesions. So uh, th this person might say that they're, they're brighter than white matter on, on T2-weighted MRI. They're, Darker than white matter on T1 weighted MRI, and and you know they can talk about a location, uh, periventricular lesions are common, et cetera, et cetera. Um, um, and and this is the approach that uh, we used for decades for for designing uh, segmentation algorithms. Um, but the problem is that um, having uh, users define the features um, is that these descriptions don't translate well into computer programming. Um, they're generally not precise enough 
um, and they're generally incomplete. So, you know, that's where deep learning come, comes in. Uh, so in contrast, uh, in, the, in the deep learning approach, the user supplies the images and a desired um, outcome for each image um, to provide uh, training data. So in, in this case, uh, the desired outcome for each MRI is a ground truth uh, lesion mask that was uh, produced by some uh, expert clinician or technician, uh, probably at some uh, considerable expense or, or effort. And what deep learning does, it automatically finds the features that are associated uh, with the outcomes that are provided. Um, so the, the features that you see on the right are features that a deep learning algorithm would find useful for segmentation, but um, semantically, they don't have much meaning for, for the user. So after training, uh, deep learning can use these learned features to segment a, a new image to um, um, provide uh, a new um, uh, lesion mask. And you can do something similar with, uh, with clinical diagnosis and uh, prediction in the context of supervised learning that uh, Prash explained earlier. So something that I, I like to emphasize is this contrast between user-defined features and deep learned features. And, and um, so, you know, as I mentioned, user-defined features are based on prior human knowledge. They're semantically useful. Um, however, they're limited by what you can see and they don't translate well into computer programming. On the other hand, um, deep learned features are automatically derived from the targets. Um, they're not easily interpreted. Um, they're limited by data and they require technical expertise in order to extract them. So here's a, a greatly simplified diagram that represents uh, the questions that need to be answered in order to, to choose uh, machine learning methods. Um, so uh, as Prash mentioned, you want to um, define your task first. So you're trying to discover structure in, in unlabeled data. Are you uh, trying to predict values uh, such as a clinical score, um, in, in which case uh, you would be uh, some sort of regression task? Or are you trying to predict um, a category such as a, a particular uh, clinical outcome? And, and say you want to do a classification. That's when, um, oops, that's when um, um, you know you want to ask some some of these key questions here. Is your data linear? Um, how many samples are there? Uh, deep learning tends to be uh, the most data hungry of, of all the machine learning methods. Um, how many classes are there? Um, uh, binary classification tends to be um, easier to do, um, and, uh, whereas multi-class or more than two classes uh, tends to be more complicated. Uh, the dimensionality of your, of your um, data samples it is important. So uh, images are an example of a high dimensionality sample because uh, they're represented by a very long set of numbers that represent the, the, uh, the uh, pixel values. And, and for these, th uh, these type of data, um, um, deep learning tends to be, it tends to have some benefits. Um, most critically, um, are, are all your features known? If, if you already know all the features that you want to work with and you're, you're sure that you don't need anything else, um, you probably don't need deep learning. Um, you know, is interpretability important? And um, neural networks are, are more difficult to interpret. It's, it's uh, spawned a whole field of research um, in, in um, interpretability and, and, uh, and deep learning. Um, and finally, does uh, training speed matter? Uh, neural networks uh, tend to be quite computationally intensive, especially with uh, high dimensionality data. And at the far right there, I've just uh, listed a few of the common uh, classifiers. And, 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 and certainly these questions are, 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 many of them are relevant to regression and even some to clustering as well. But I've just kept the discussion to classification just to keep it simple. And uh, that's it for me. Hopefully I've given you some idea of when it might be appropriate to use deep learning. 
Wonderful. Thank you for that, Dr. Tam. Um, could you give us an example from your own research for, say, each of those last examples, clustering and regression and whatnot? Um, yeah, certainly. We've been working with, um, so I'm collaborating with uh, Dr. Kendall Ho from Emergency Medicine and, um, and a few um, colleagues in cardiology as well. And we've been using uh, public health data. Mm -hmm. And what we found is that uh, we, basically we haven't seen a big benefit to, uh, to deep learning for, for that type of data. So uh, for, for us, uh, uh, you know, random forest tends to work quite well. Mm -hmm. And it's more interpretable in terms of uh, how it selects features. So uh, we're ha we've been having pretty, pretty good luck with that. Um, Wonderful. Yeah, SVMs, we haven't used too much. Um, um, Clustering also uh, not too much. Uh, yeah, mostly random forest and deep learning. Yeah, wonderful. Well, thank you for that. Thank you. Well, we'll move right on uh, and getting a, perhaps a big picture view on whether AI is uh, AI for healthcare is a myth or a reality. And I'd like to welcome Dr. Parang Abulmasumi. Uh, Dr. Abulmasumi is an internationally recognized uh, professor and has received numerous awards for his pioneering developments in medical image analysis and image-guided interventions. He carries out research in medical imaging, machine learning, and image-guided diagnoses, as well as interventions. Artificial intelligence and machine learning techniques are applied to diagnosis in ultrasound, magnetic resonance imaging, digitized pathology slides, and other tissue images. Uh, please welcome Dr. Abel Musumi. And we can see your slides. Thank you so much, Rohit. And uh, it's uh, difficult to fill the shoes of my previous presenters, uh, but it's great to see so many people attending today's uh, talk. Um, um, this uh, uh, kind of set of slides kind of summarizes at least my own experience uh, over the past eight to nine years working with um, um, uh, some of my great colleagues in the Faculty of Medicine, including Dr. Teresa Sang, to build a lot of kind of AI modules and evaluate them uh, for health care mm -hmm. impact. So um, I guess uh, kind of you started kind of this research with really the question, really is AI our next savior? And uh, as Prashant put it, really, I mean, with very small tweaks in, in the image pixels, you can kind of fool the current AI models. Um, and you can see in your own work, I mean, many of the vendors are really racing to the finish line to be able to put um, a lot of new um, AI uh, spin on their product line and, 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 and as a result grows uh, sales. But we also have, I mean, evidence from other industry that these systems are not necessarily always reliable. And in healthcare, it's, this is critical. Um, there are a lot of, um, uh, I guess, commercial marketing, I guess, that are going on. I just wanted to highlight some of them. As an example, there's a company called Ultramics. They're doing a fantastic job in terms of scaling up their AI platform. But some of the things, you know, that, that are reported, for example, in their product in terms of um, for example, one thing that they say is that uh, obviously two users would would report the ejection fraction, for example, differently uh, or as different parameters differently. But AI always does, you know, perfectly uh, when uh, two different operators run the same piece of code, which is expected. Um, so th th it comes down to what Prashant showed, you know, in terms of uh, what are the key things that are um, relevant in the context of healthcare. Most AI today, they, are, they have low accuracy, but very high precision. Uh, but what you really want is high accuracy and high precision. There are uh, lots of reports coming out, for example, from the uh, combination of the computer science and, and, and uh, medicine researchers. These are two studies, for example, that are published by uh, you know, so San Francisco and Stanford and Harvard um, collaboration where they show fantastic results in terms of the mean error 
uh, the luminar is very low, but obviously when your entire, most of your population is actually normal, mean error would be kind of low, but that is not, that doesn't mean that the clinical uh, utility is high, because for example, in this case, if you look at the low ejection fraction cases that are critical clinically, the errors are as high as 30%. So um, we kind of have to read between the lines. You have to read fine prints. These are, for example, two of the products that this is basically the FDA documentation for two of the products that are used uh, for commercially for estimating the ejection fraction in echocardiography. And if you read the fine print, the number of cases that were used for, for getting the approval were 300 and 378. None of the physicians on this call most likely can get their fellowship and their certificate if they just have this much experience with this many patients, you know? Um, so uh, you can't really expect miracles from AI when it fails afterwards. This is another product from uh, GE with uh, the kind of the famous view scan and the collaboration with the company in Israel, Dye Imaging, which also was recalled uh, as a result of overestimation bias because of exactly the graphs that I showed you in the previous slides. Uh, this is another case of AI failing for butterfly imaging. Um, and um, uh, uh, again, there is a lot of these examples that are happening, but at the same time, the promise of AI is actually something that we have never seen before. And as a result of this promise, there's a lot of investment in this domain, which eventually will impact patient care as we are hoping that someday we get into a Tesla and it can drive us home without having to touch anything. So um, we took advantage of kind of the investments in this domain. And over the past two years uh, with the team at, at the Faculty of Medicine and uh, uh, Providence Healthcare, um, we um, put together a, a project for deployment of point of care uh, devices across BC. So now I can basically, um, Probably say that you know BC actually is one of the, I would think the only place in the world that has such a very broad coverage of point of care ultrasound devices that are interconnected through a privacy approved uh, cloud system um, that is designed for AI development and augmentation and validation of a lot of technology. So over the past two years, we have developed tools for lung imaging, cardiac imaging, and obstetrics, and the applications are just expanding. Uh, one other thing that we're doing is that now we're going um, from um, uh, just detection in images to prediction as well. So for example, we are linking with pop population data VC, and um, uh, we're looking at outcome data and, and, and trying to determine whether there are pathways to go from from uh, imaging um, uh, to predict outcome. And the first project we are tackling is actually stroke imaging. Um, uh, the uh, one, uh, one message also I wanna kind of finish with is that among, in all of this kind of public outreach is actually a key uh, part of our, of our uh, strategy. Um, uh, so kind of events like this, I also spent the past year kind of writing a book with the, with the funding from the Peter Wall Institute and nine other colleagues across UBC and trying to kind of capture kind of going from kind of a rural versus urban, you know, uh, resource difference to a kind of a unified kind of community that is taking advantage of AI uh, along with many other things, including policies uh, to kind of uh, democratize healthcare in our province. So with this, I end the talk. Thank you so much, Parang. Uh, and excellent to know of the happenings re with regards to AI in our own backyard here at NBC. Uh, quite a tremendous piece of work you, you're part out there. Um, while we have them, any questions for uh, Professor Roger Tam or Professor Parang Sumi? give people a few seconds. And again, you're more here. Uh, Dan Holmes, go ahead. Hi there. Thank you very much, all three of you, um, for um, your presentations. One of the challenges that, um, so I'm in the Department of Pathology and Lab Medicine, I'm medical director at St. Paul's Hospital. And so far, what we've seen of, um, of attempts for machine learning AI for anatomical pathology have been 
you know, the, something that functions at the level of an advanced medical student or junior resident. In other words, just simply not good enough for an application and very vulnerable to uh, changes in performance due to different using a different stainer uh, at a different organization and, you know, things that are really that don't distract humans in the slightest, but seem to distract deep learning models. So this has made me want to see um, AI machine learning wor wor work more as a decision support tool from numerical data. And um, have any of you worked on that? Like the, the, the sort of, um, you know, working from the oceans of lab data that we have and health record data, rather than working on the, the, the imaging uh, question, which seems much harder. But I, I, and the other thing is like it, when you do decision support, you avoid the whole regulatory question rather than, you know, you're, you're, you're serving up information to, to an individual to help them with a task that is repetitive rather than trying to make a definitive diagnosis or classification. Mm -hmm. And maybe I can, I can briefly. Go ahead, something. please, Brian. Thank you. So, um, so a lot of our, our work, I mean, thank you for bringing up this very important point. I mean, uh, uh, AI is, despite the trillions of dollars investment in this until now, um, it still is at the baby step. I mean, basically you could think about it that this is like your first backup camera on the car. <laughs> You're very far from kind of being fully automatically driving. But uh, a lot of kind of the, the current uh, technologies that are uh, being developed and the FDA, uh, I guess, guidelines that were released, I think October 25th this year, uh, they are actually putting kind of a statement of a human AI team, yeah? And this is really kind of driving a lot of our designs on how to take advantage of, of kind of this concept that these two entities of AI and human are actually going to be working together to make at the end one final decision for a patient. So this is a, exactly along the line of thinking. I mean, the, uh, many of the initial products that I showed you kind of uh, in terms of kind of, they had a recall, for example, they were trying to fully solve this problem, you know, and, and so that physician doesn't need to think. And that at least till now, it hasn't been proven to be valid. Uh, um, at some point, maybe when Tesla can drive or fly, I mean, maybe this can happen too. But uh, but currently we are too far from it. Now, in terms of the, the working with the numerical data, in the stroke project that I actually highlighted, we actually looked at the numerical data to derive the imaging questions. So, for example, we looked at data from about uh, the clinical records of tens of thousands of patients, and we used all of the unsupervised clustering methods that my colleagues mentioned to figure out what are the key clinical parameters that are mostly correlated for example, with the stroke in this case. And those drove the questions we have to ask for AI to solve, while at the same time being aware that AI is not very good to solve some of the rare pathology questions, for example, for us today. Uh, so a lot of kind of these come into our design. Yeah, and there's a lot of really low hanging operational processes that are driven by humans um, that are labor intensive and repetitive that seem to be where, you know, it could be really helpful to have machine learning AI help with the decision support and just sort of get humans off the boring tasks. And in a lot of circumstances, I don't even, I think that in healthcare, particularly, people don't even realize that such an approach would be uh, useful or, or possible. So um, I, I'm, I'm interested in the operational questions um, or the, those laboratory decision support questions. And we have lots of them if you're interested. Oh, oh absolutely. I mean, the, the one, one challenge, actually, maybe I can, before my colleagues comment, is that uh, uh, the, one of the challenges is that on the, on the commercial side, when you automate a lot of things, then the whole discussion of the reimbursement and who gets paid changes, you know? Oh, I'm talking about non-reimbursable <laughs> activities, like yeah. taking paper requisitions and converting them into the correct lab orders and things like that. But, but thank you very much for your talk. Wonderful. Thank you for that phenomenal question. And thank you, Parang, for, for answering that. Uh, in the interest of time, I am going to move on to our uh, two use cases presented by two PhD students here at UBC. I believe, Mariam, are you going first? 
Um, yeah, I can go first. Perfect. Okay. So Miriam is a first year PhD student working with uh, Dr. Tam. Uh, she's an electrical engineer with a background in medical imaging and a passion for learning new things. She's currently pursuing a master's, oh, sorry, a PhD degree in biomedical engineering with a focus on developing new deep learning methods to perform computer assisted diagnosis and prediction of disease progression in multiple sclerosis. Please take it away. Sure, I'm gonna just share my slides. Awesome. And I can see your slides, that's great. Perfect, um, so thank you Rohit for, um, for a good introduction. Um, and as you already know that I'm um, with uh, Roger Tam's lab. Um, and today I'm just gonna briefly talk about um, our experiments uh, with um, uh, predicting uh, clinical outcomes um, in, deep, uh, in multiple sclerosis using um, machine learning. So a little bit about multiple sclerosis, we know that it's a potentially disabling disease of the spinal cord and uh, brain, where uh, the body's immunity basically attacks the myelin covering that is present around the neuronal cell fibers, and depending on the site of the damage, um, it uh, manifest as different uh, symptoms like loss of vision, um, loss of speech, loss of uh, bowel and bladder control and muscle fatigue, etc. Um, and currently there are no cures of MS, but um, an early diagnosis and um, proactive treatment can help preserve the quality of life in individuals that have early symptoms that are suggestible of MS, which is why there's a lot of interest in the ability to identify individuals who presented these initial symptoms, but have a potential to progress within a given um, time frame. Um, and also just to touch upon that, um, Canada has the highest incidence of MS in North America and estimated 93,000 Canadians are living with MS. So uh, the neurological tissue in brain is broadly categorized into white matter and uh, gray matter, where white matter uh, is the uh, neuronal cell fibers that have myelin sheath around them. Um, and um, deep, uh, uh, sorry, the gray matter um, constitutes of the uh, neuronal cell nuclei. And um, an important collection of these nuclei is present in the deep parts of the brain called um, deep gray matter. And um, one of the more obvious manifestation of uh, MS is are these um, areas of localized hyperintensities on brain MRI. Uh, and we know that brain MRIs um, are the um, primary tools which are used by the clinicians for the diagnosis and um, disease monitoring uh, in MS. So you can see that these white matter uh, lesions, which are these areas of hyperintensities are the more obvious a manifestation of the disease, whereas um, a less obvious manifestation are these changes, uh, the morphological changes that are happening in the deep gray matter structures of the brain, which can be seen as um, these changes in shape and sizes and also tissue contours. But these changes are not readily observable, especially in the very early stage of the disease where we are interested in. So, um, Right now, we know that white matter pathology is an important indicator of the disease progression, but we also know that deep gray matter atrophy is a consistent feature in all MS phenotypes. Um, and the studies have shown a strong relationship between deep gray matter volumetric loss and clinical worsening, but the utility of these deep gray matters for predicting disease activity is largely unexplored, especially in the early disease. So with these, um, background in mind, we hypothesized that we can apply classical machine learning methods, um, uh, apply to uh, more numerical and user-defined features, as well as deep gray matter volumes um, to uh, kind of classify these individuals who are presenting with this early disease to predict whether or not they are at a high risk of um, developing new disease uh, within two years. And then we also hypothesized that deep learning can be applied to deep gray matter structures directly to learn the patterns of regional morphological changes that can then predict uh, the new disease activity within two years. And to test out our um, hypotheses, we used the data that was collected from a uh, Finnish 
clinical trial that uh, tested the efficacy of minocycline for delaying uh, multiple sclerosis uh, in this prodromal uh, population of uh, MS, which is called uh, clinically isolated syndrome. And about 80% of the clinically isolated syndrome patients do progress to develop a full-blown MS within um, five to eight years. And if you're able to identify those individuals, then you can um, take early intervention to preserve the quality of life. So we had 140 individuals who took part in this trial and roughly 57% uh, of those individuals uh, converted to MS at the end of uh, these 24 months, whereas the remaining stayed stable. And we used the three-dimensional C1 weighted MRIs that were um, taken um, at the baseline to uh, do our uh, machine learning modeling. So what we did was we took those MRIs, we did a bunch of image processing and data preparation that is a whole thing in itself um, with the uh, end goal of segmenting these uh, deep gray matter nuclei that we were interested in, uh, which include the thalamide, pitamina, globi pallida, and caudate nuclei. And we then calculated um, individual um, volumes of these structures, as well as these 3D segmentations of these structures for conducting our um, experiments with more classical machine learning and then deep learning. We also had other user-defined features that included uh, the white matter lesion load, the total brain volume, and other demographic features that we then kind of combined with these um, deep gray matter features to do our modeling. With deep gray matter, uh, sorry, with deep learning, uh, we did these uh, experiment setups um, that use sevenfold cross-validation to first um, train a model in a training phase in a supervised setup where you give it these uh, 3D segmentations as well as the, the target that we're looking to uh, predict uh, in the training phase, uh, whereas in testing phase, you just provide the model with these um, deep gray matter volumes. Um, that were previously unseen during the training phase uh, to then predict uh, whether or not uh, the, the, the individual is going to develop disease, new disease activity within two years. And with our deep learning model, uh, which were consisting of convolution neural networks, um, we were able to uh, correctly identify individuals who did uh, progress at, 20, um, at 24 months uh, with a 67% accuracy and 78% um, sensitivity. And just to highlight, just to put a context uh, to these um, performance metrics, um, the disease course uh, in MS is very, very variable and it's, um, it's not a trivial task. To, uh, to predict whether or not an individual who is presenting with these similar symptoms is going to predict, uh, progress within a given time frame. We then uh, did our experiments with the user-defined features where we employed different um, methods for the feature selections from a given set of features that we had in our hands. Um, and it's interesting to see that almost all um, well, not almost, like all of the um, uh, feature selection methods kind of picked the deep gray matter features as more important and more informative for this prediction task, in addition to uh, burden of disease, which uh, indicates the white matter lesion load, which we already know is an indicator. But one take, big takeaway from uh, our experiments uh, with the more clean, uh, with more traditional machine learning method, which where we use a random forest, was that um, a random forest trained with um, manually selected features into which the domain knowledge went in to select uh, which what uh, features to train with kind of outperformed um, all of our experiments uh, that were trained using um, features selected with more automated feature selection methods. Um, and to conclude, uh, we were able to demonstrate that both machine learning models and deep learning models were able to learn uh, these um, patterns that could uh, predict uh, future disease activity. But one main um, take home message was that our more traditional methods outperformed uh, the deep learning methods. Um, and we also kind of uh, concluded that um, manual feature selection kind of outperformed the more automated feature selection. And yeah, I'll conclude here. I know that we are crunched for time and I'm happy to take um, any questions. Wonderful, thank you. Uh, if you have questions for, for Marianne, please enter them in the chat while we move on to Hoda. Uh, Hoda, please start sharing your slides when you can. 
Uh, Hoda is a fourth year PhD candidate in the Robotics and Controls Laboratory, supervised by Dr. Robert Rowling and Dr. Tim Salkudian. Uh, she's in the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering. Her research involves developing computer vision based algorithms for three dimensional tissue motion estimation, as well as ultra fast elastography, that is, the measure of stiffness to improve the accuracy of ultrasound image analysis and reduce examination time. Please take it away, Hoda. Uh, yeah, hi everybody. Um, thank you so much, Yohit, for the nice introduction. And uh, today I'm gonna talk about uh, 3D motion estimation for ultrasound elastography. Well, I will start by talking about the uh, brief overview of palpation and elastography process. Then I will explain the tissue motion estimation. Uh, okay, uh, in palpation, doctors use uh, their fingers to palpate the tissue, and by doing that, they can get access to the stiffness. And stiffness is an important property of the tissue because it links to pathology. It means that if an abnormal condition or a disease starts to progress inside the tissue, then the stiffness will change. So by having the stiffness, we can... Um, detect the disease. And therefore, palpation is uh, an important tool, but um, the problem is that uh, it depends on the physician. So ultrasound elastography was uh, introduced as a quantitative tool to minimize the dependency of the diagnosis to the physician. And now I wanna explain the big picture of uh, elastography for you. Uh, in all elastography methods, we have a transducer that we put on the tissue and then uh, we should generate some vibrations inside the tissue. And there are uh, many ways to do that. For example, we can use the acoustic signals of the transducer to um, generate these vibrations within the tissue or we can use an external vibration source. Like here we have a plate as the external vibration source. Then uh, we collect some ultrasound data, and after that, we calculate the uh, motion field between the ultrasound frames. By having the motion field and solving the wave equation, we can get the stiffness of the tissue. For example, here, the yellow color shows, uh, higher, uh, the, shows the areas with higher stiffness values, and the uh, um, Basically, uh, blue color shows the regions with lower stiffness value. And here, for this step, to calculate the motion field between ultrasound frames, we use the AI algorithms and um, some concepts in computer vision. Um, that's very important to know that the displacement of the tissue, uh, they are very small. For example, for the shear wave elastography, the displacements are um, in the order of uh, microsec a micrometer. So um, it's very important uh, to have very accurate uh, motion estimation uh, methods to um, basically uh, estimate such, uh, such a, a tiny displacement. Um, well, we have developed um, a 2D open source uh, software for tissue motion estimation, and it needs only two ultrasound frames and will give you the uh, displacement field uh, between uh, those two frames. Uh, but in reality, the tissue moves in three directions. So we expanded our method to the uh, 3D tissue motion estimation, and it's more accurate compared to the one-dimensional and two-dimensional methods. Uh, we have tested our method on an XVivo placenta data set. Uh, for example, here uh, you can see um, a displacement field in three directions for one of the patients. Uh, if you are interested to know about the details and also the mathematical stuff behind that, you can uh, refer to this paper. Um, we also tested our method on a breast cancer data set. Uh, here you can see a BMOD image of a malignant lesion. And um, the location of the tumor is uh, shown here by an specialist. This is the stiffness map that we calculated. Uh, as you can see here, um, 
the areas where the tumor is located uh, in the map, there, there are higher uh, stiffness values compared to the healthy surrounding tissue. Actually, in some cases, the tumor is not very visible in the BMOD image. Um, for example, here, this is a BMOD of a benign lesion, and the location of the tumor is uh, marked here by an specialist. Um, sorry. Yeah, and this is the stiffness map that we calculated. And you can see that uh, here, again, the uh, areas that the tumor is located shows higher stiffness compared to the healthy normal tissues. So um, in summary, a stiffness of the tissue correlates with pathology. So elastography can be beneficial in detecting abnormal conditions of the tissue. And also tissue motion estimation is a necessary step in all elastography methods. Um, therefore, we developed a 2D and 3D motion estimation method using computer vision algorithm and optimization techniques. Thank you for your attention. Wonderful, thank you, Hoda. Uh, thank you both to you and Maryam for your, your interesting use cases on uh, different applications of AI. Uh, we'll have a few seconds here for any questions for these two in the chat. But while we're waiting for questions, I'd like to thank everyone for attending. Uh, hopefully you've left today's session with a better understanding of AI's capabilities, limitations, and what's required to collaborate with an engineering or technical individual on AI. Uh, we've also seen some excellent case studies of successful projects, both by uh, up and coming emerging PhD students as well as province-wide in the province of British Columbia. Uh, please, you'll be receiving an exit survey in your emails uh, from Danielle. Uh, please fill those out because they help us inform and improve the workshop for next time. And really, we wanna hear what you think. Seeing no questions for our panelists, uh, Danielle, okay if I ended there? Yeah, thank you. Thank okay. you everyone, that was fantastic. Okay, uh, ignore the blunder in the background. Uh, that's dinner time, so. All right. Thanks, everyone. Great. Thank you all. Thanks, everyone.